Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Stuart Butler. I'm a senior fellow here at the Brookings Institution, and I want to welcome you to our event today. I also want to welcome the uh, many people that are watching this online. And uh, we will be able to take some questions from people uh, online if you use the uh, hashtag mobilizing millennials. It's a scary thought, isn't it? But anyway, uh, if you use that tag, you can uh, uh, also ask questions, which we can uh, include during the discussion. Uh, I'm going to be by far the oldest person that you're going to see on stage uh, uh, today. Uh, I'm a kind of a late baby boomer, and uh, for decades I've been working in public policy, uh, really warning that there are certain trends that are very dangerous uh, for future generations, and urging action on uh, particularly an area of uh, economic policy and fiscal policy, um, arguing that we need to act now uh, in order to forestall uh, problems and dangers in the future. And there are two particular ones that uh, I and others here at Brookings and many other places have been uh, discussing uh, for many years, climate change and the problem of the rising federal debt and deficits and its uh, potential impact uh, uh, on us. And both issues, uh, both climate change and, uh, and the debt, uh, involve uh, plenty of experts uh, warning of the problems of inaction uh, both are examples, I think, of the conventional wisdom in politics that it's very difficult uh, to get people really riled up and moving on an issue where the impact is going to be many years in the future, and yet to take action involves pain right now. So both of these are really classic examples of the challenge of trying to get, uh, uh, get people uh, really engaged in these, uh, in these issues. And both are likely to have particular problems for millennials and younger generations uh, in the future, whether it be through rising taxes or inflation, perhaps, uh, or other issues, uh, that the impact is going to be very much on these younger generations. But at the, same, uh, at the same time as we have and have had demonstrations outside of Brookings here on Massachusetts Avenue about climate change and speeches in the UN and plenty of action and, and uh, uh, on the online and on the streets, somehow the whole issue of the federal debt and deficits is a big yawn uh, for so many people. We don't see demonstrations outside uh, and so on. So what we're going to do today is to try to explore why this is so uh, and to learn from each issue uh, for the other in terms of the lessons of how to think about it and particularly how to encourage and, in, and to mobilize younger people to take action on these issues and particularly in the area of federal debt. And these we'll be describing in, in a panel just uh, following shortly, some of these generational differences in attitudes and feelings on these issues, and we'll discuss what the research shows, uh, suggests in terms of lessons of how people in the public policy field should think about uh, how to engage with younger Americans on these long-term issues. And what we in the public policy field, and particularly we in the baby boom generation, uh, that wonder about these things, what we should actually be doing. But before the, uh, before the panel itself, uh, we've asked Representative Derek Kilmer to join us uh, to make some opening remarks. And uh, Representative Kilmer is from the 6th District of Washington State, and there are several reasons why we've asked him in particular to come and, and share his thoughts about this general issue. The first is, though, although he doesn't technically meet uh, the cutoff point for being a millennial, he's pretty close. Uh, and he's acquired a reputation as one of the most dynamic uh, young members uh, in the House. Secondly, he's a policy on, uh, innovator. In fact, I first met uh, uh, Congressman Kilmer some years ago when he was working on a proposal to encourage savings among first-time savers and, and uh, 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 poorer Americans uh, using the behavioral economics of lotteries and, uh, and raffles uh, to design an approach to encourage uh, uh, to put into place a mechanism to uh, enable people to save more effectively. He's also a driver of congressional uh, reform in the Congress. Uh, he was a member of the Joint Select Committee on Budget Process, so he's very aware of these issues associated with, uh, with fiscal issues. And he chairs uh, the House Select Committee on Modernization, uh, uh, which was recently set up. Uh, so, and finally, last but by no means least, he's been one of the foremost members of using congressional caucuses as, as a vehicle to spur 
thoughtful bipartisan discussion uh, on major issues. Uh, he's a member of the Future Caucus, which is uh, for younger members of both parties, and he co-chairs uh, the Bi House Bipartisan uh, Working uh, Group. And I should say that the Future Caucus is supported by, uh, outside of the Congress, by the Millen Millennial Action uh, Project, which is co-sponsoring, co-hosting co this uh, event with us uh, today. So I'm delighted that uh, Congressman Kilmer is with us, and I invite you to uh, address us. Well, um, thank you for your tepid applause. Uh, it's, it's good to be with you. I want to um, thanks everyone for being here today. I want to thank Dr. Butler for the uh, kind introduction and Brookings and the Millennial Action Project for uh, hosting this important conversation. It's an honor to be with all of you. And I'm going to start by doing something a little bit dangerous, given how early in the morning it is. But hopefully you've all had a few cups of coffee. Some of you still seem to be working on it. But I want to start off by asking everyone to just close their eyes for a second. Just close your eyes. And I want you to take a second and think about climate change and think about what it looks like to you. And now you can open them. I want to tell you what I see when I close my eyes and think about climate change. When I close my eyes, I, I think about uh, being on the Pacific Ocean, on the coast, in a little village called Tahola in Grays Harbor County, Washington. And when I close my eyes and I think about it, I think of standing there with a woman named Fawn Sharp, who's the president of the Quinault Indian Nation. And uh, we're standing right on the ocean. And any one of us in this room could throw a rock and land it in the ocean. We're that close. And she says to me, when I was a kid, the ocean was more than a football field's length away from our village. And she said, now it's our front porch. And she talked about the fact that now every time there's a severe storm, they live in fear that their seawall is going to breach and just fill their village up like a bowl. Their village uh, has been there since time immemorial, but it's below sea level. And when I close my eyes, I see their village filled with water. And I see one of their tribal members literally rowing in a canoe through the streets of the village, which happened. Uh, they've begun to see the impacts of climate change right now with rising sea levels and more severe storms, not to mention the threat of tsunami. And they're one of four tribes in the district that I represent that are in the process of right now trying to move to higher ground. Sometimes when I close my eyes and I think about climate change, I think of a young woman in my district who's a shellfish grower in our region. There are 3,200 people in my region whose livelihoods are tied to that industry. And she's working to follow in the footsteps of her father and her grandfather and working in that industry. And when I close my eyes, I think about her talking to me about the uncertainty that she and thousands of people like her face uh, in dealing with ocean acidification, changing ocean chemistry, and the inability of oysters to actually form a shell as a consequence of changing ocean chemistry. And I'm sure when you close your eyes, you thought of other stories and scenes, ones that you can see and touch and feel in your, in your lives. So now I want to um, ask you to close your eyes again. Close your eyes. And this time, as you sit there with your eyes closed, I want you to think about the national debt and what it means to you. OK, you can open them. If you're like me, most of what you saw is what you see when you're trying to fall asleep. <laughs> kind of blackness or um, sheep jumping over clouds. Uh, perhaps you see one of those big debt clocks that are, you know, tabulating numbers. Or maybe if you're a guy my age, you saw Ra Ross Perot wagging his figure while, uh, finger while uh, holding a chart or a graph. So I was asked uh, in my involvement in this to share my thoughts on why some issues like climate change are compelling to policymakers and compelling to millennials, while other issues like the national debt often fail to rise to that challenge. And I would argue that the exercise that we just all went through together, to some degrees, reflects some of the differences in dynamics that cause some issues to demand urgent action and some issues to be largely swept aside. First, we all respond when there's a personal connection 
when I asked you to think about climate change, I would guess that almost everyone in this room thought of something uh, personal to them, either where they grew up uh, or a story that's been on national news, like the burning of the rainforest in the Amazon. There's hardly a community that isn't being impacted in some way by the impacts of climate change, whether you're on the coast or you live along ever increasingly flooding rivers or you live in the plains that are going through drought. The ways in which we talk about debt, though, are fundamentally different. And I'm not sure it needs to be that way. Debt remains a serious concern for millennials and younger generations, especially when they personally encountering, encounter the rising costs of earning an education and joining the workforce. Student debt in this country has now surpassed credit card debt. And I find myself thinking that perhaps if connections were made that personalize the issue of national debt, that make it real to actual human beings rather than making it feel like an ethereal policy conversation, then maybe we'd see it have more salience as a political issue. And let me just speak for myself for a second. I admit I've generally preferred politicians with a sense of fiscal responsibility. I think I caucused for Paul Songus in 1992. I was the guy in Washington State who did that. Um, but I, 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 don't, I don't think I really thought about our long-term fiscal challenges in a personal way until my wife was pregnant with our second child. It was the first time that we went to go see a financial planner. And I acknowledge up front, I was lucky to have had the ability to go see a financial planner, period. But I'll never forget how our financial planner began our conversation. She said, I need to ask you a question that will dictate how all of the other questions we go through from here uh, will go. And then she asked a simple question. She said, um, do you want to assume that Social Security still exists when you retire? The notion that Social Security might not even exist when I get to the age of re retirement, let alone when my children do, is really daunting. And as we consider how to engage on issues, it strikes me that making them tangible and personal is actually important. And I'm struck that the panelists that we hear from next may use data and science to rebut some of what I say. Um, but my observation is that young people are amazingly engaged. They are dialed in on so many challenges, and frankly, they face so many more challenges than other generations in many regards. But if we want to engage folks on the fiscal matters that Stuart asked me to speak to, I would argue that we have to make them real. We have to paint a picture of what action will mean to their lives, to the things they care about. Uh, as Stuart pointed out, engaging people on personal consequences and personal actions can create buy-in. In my own neck of the woods, we have final financial institutions that are engaging young people not only on financial literacy, but on practical actions they can take to ensure a sound financial future. It's being made personal. And that brings me to the second point I want to make, that as we deal with the climate crisis, there are powerful messengers painting the picture with a real sense of urgency. It's something that has broken through to the point where the Weather Channel just announced that even the Weather Channel is now going to ask political candidates to talk about it. We've seen scientific data that makes clear that we are coming upon a point of no return when it comes to climate change, that we need climate action now, and that there might actually be a scenario where our inaction leads to our demise. That in and of itself has created a sense of urgency. My state's governor, Jay Inslee, I think says it really well. He says we are the first generation to see the impacts of climate change and the last generation that can do something about it. But our messengers on climate are not just politicians. There are notable experts, scientists, and academics, and entire panels at major world sum summits focus on how to address the problem as a global community. And you have young people themselves as messengers. Greta Thunberg led an international climate strike with over 7.5 million people in 180 countries and delivered a uniquely impassioned speech to hundreds of world leaders at the United Nations. You have tremendous funding behind national and global advocacy groups that are demanding action and creating a class of climate-specific voters. Now, let's contrast that with the fiscal questions. I would argue that we haven't seen a similar dynamic. Make no mistake, this budget crisis is serious, according to the Committee for a Responsible Budget. Today, the national debt is more than $22 trillion. This year, in 2019, we're expected as a nation to have $3.5 trillion in total revenue and $4.4 trillion in total spending, meaning we will borrow about $900 billion. 
What that means is more and more of a young person's paycheck will go to just servicing debt, and there's a real concern that debt will crowd out other priorities that young people care about, including health care and environmental protection, education, and other priorities. But I can't help but feel like there are forces at play that lead voters, and particularly millennial voters, not to make this a priority. For one, at this point, to most everyday Americans, adding a $900 billion to $22 trillion just doesn't it just seems like something that is so far out of their control that they hardly blink. It doesn't feel tangible even. The debt crisis doesn't feel localized. It doesn't feel personal. It doesn't, to most people, feel urgent. We certainly have some great groups out there, Fix the Debt, uh, that coalition, the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, who are doing amazing work, especially in this town, to try to engage people. But most of the leading voices on this issue don't have as much credibility with young people. For, for the most part, those who talk about the debt are politicians who will say that the debt is an existential threat in one speech and then vote for a giant tax cut for the wealthiest Amer Americans, further exploding the debt in the next breath. So it's easy to be cynical. Think about the only times you've seen the issue of debt break through in our politics. I would argue the only time it really broke through in a, in a real way was in 1992. At that time, the national debt was just $4 trillion, just 62% of our GDP. And at that time, you had a presidential candidate who was very much not a politician who made it his primary reason for running and make the issue compelling. And whenever that candidate, Ross Perot, got in front of a microphone, he would say, the debt is like the crazy aunt we keep down in the basement. All the neighbors know she's there, but nobody wants to talk about her. And not only was he re reacting to public opinion, he was actually shaping public opinion. And as a consequence, you saw something during the Clinton presidency that now seems like a distant memory, surpluses. I would argue that we need a virtuous cycle again of public leaders and public opinion reinforcing one another on debt. Public policymaking is like physics. A an object at rest tends to stay at rest. Hell, even when there is motion and force, as we've seen on the issue of gun violence, there is still inaction by the U.S. Senate and by the White House. So there's a fundamental question of how do we shape public opinion on this issue? And I would argue part of the answer is talking about it. And toward that end, I've sponsored a bill to create something called the Fiscal State of the Nation Address, in which our nation's comptroller general, not a politician, would address a joint session of Congress each year to try to elevate the issue of the debt. Now, even that proposal, I will readily admit, has its shortcomings. First, I would argue that the Fiscal State of the Nation Address probably unlikely to go viral. <laughs> Not going to see a huge spike in C-SPAN ratings. Also, economists may also not be the most compelling messengers. I'm reminded of a sign that hung in the economics department when I was in college that said, there are three kinds of economists, those that can count and those that can't. <laughs> but. Maybe the folks from the local credit union who are coming into the high school to talk about financial literacy and our financial stability, maybe those folks are the right messengers. And maybe, just maybe, we should be building a grassroots effort on these issues that engage young people, since it's their generation that will be damaged the worst by inaction on it. And some of that should fall on the shoulder of some of our younger public officials. Uh, each day I'm at risk of no longer being put in the category of young public officials. But having said that, I'm still proud to still qualify for a coalition in the House called the Future Forum. And we're a group of younger members that have traveled the country in engaging millennials where they are. And I am so wildly impressed by the young people we've engaged. They're in so many ways more engaged, more open to new ideas, more embracing of diversity. We visited college campuses and have done town halls. We sat down with young military veterans. We visited technology hubs. And I can promise you that 95% of the conversations we have are driven by the things that yo those young people are concerned about. Young people engage us on the issue of student debt because they see it as personal, as a burden that will constrain their life choices. They talk to us about gun violence and climate change because they see these issues as a clear and present danger. They talk to us about housing affordability because they are struggling to make ends meet. They talk to us about net neutrality because you will take streaming Netflix from their cold, dead hands. And as a younger elected, I'm dialed in and working on each of these issues because we're engaging with young people on each of these issues. And you know what I haven't done when I visit a college campus? I haven't gone through the Concord Coalition's budget exercise with students. I haven't run through the options laid out by Fix the Debt 
or even engage them on the impacts of debt to their future. So maybe that's on all of us. Maybe that's on me too. In the end, I come to the words of Abraham Lincoln, who said, public sentiment is everything. With public sentiment, nothing can fail, and without it, nothing can succeed. And I sincerely hope that on more issues, young people will engage, because with their engagement, we can make progress on anything. So thank you for letting me join you. Thank you for joining us uh, this morning. I really appreciate your, your comments. Uh, I must say I'm a bit horrified to hear that economists that don't have quite the standing among uh, people that I think they should have compared with scientists and other, and other people. But I think that's a very valid point that, that we need to think about very strongly. Sort of who are the uh, most likely people to have authority on talking about these, these issues? Um, and you mentioned uh, maybe bringing in the credit unions and so on, people from the lo locality, and so on. Do you want to expand a little bit on that in terms of, when, when you think about um, who carries weight on these issues, who can get through to people, who are these people, and, and why, why are they not being mobilized right now? Well, I, I, I'll say up front, I think some of the most compelling vo voices on the issue of climate are actually young people themselves, mm -hmm. right? You've seen Greta Thunberg, I think, right. um, break through because she is a compelling voice speaking uh, uh, on behalf of a generation. Um, so I think there's opportunities in, in that arena. I, I, I think uh, we have seen in my region an effort by financial institutions like the local credit union to talk to people not just about their personal finances, but to think more broadly about these issues. And I think there's opportunity there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, th I do think it's interesting to look at, uh, at climate change as, as a counterexample of how uh, trusted characters, uh, people have emerged in that area. Uh, I'm of an age where you we used to think about the weather man, or the, it's almost always a weather man, the weather person as being something of a joke, uh, particularly in England. I mean, uh, you know, it was it's always, raining. It's always yeah. going to be raining, yeah. so you, could, you just have to say that and you've got a 70% chance of being successful. Same in Washington Yes, State, exactly. Probably. I know we shared something in common uh, with regard to that. You know, and people would use uh, diagrams and, and, and use a Sharpie, I guess that still happens today, but anyway, uh, use a Sharpie, and now it's all high science. It's all the, you know, the American model, the European model, and so on. The, the, the weather uh, person, uh, as an expert, has really grown dramatically in this, in this country. And I wonder whether, you know, uh, I wonder who else you imagine is playing this role uh, in the area of, of the debt. I do think that that local people making it personal and so on. And that kind of leads me to another question, which is that, you know, when I was brought up, uh, the experience of our parents, of my parents, was very vivid in these areas. People remember the Second World War, of course, but they remember the Depression. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I went out on, on uh, town hall meetings uh, many years ago, uh, you would hear this all the time, people talking about the banks going under in the, in the Depression. So it was a very vivid thing that was passed on from generation to generation. What is it the baby boomers have not managed to do in this regard? I mean, we've not managed to uh, explain to people, to younger people, that you know, inflation, slow growth, stagnating economies, and high unemployment r related to uh, poor economic conditions was a reality that they should think about, and debt being one of them. What is it we're, what is it we're failing to do as, another, as an older generation? Yeah. I think people are shaped by personal experience you see a generation above mine that, um, you know, it, it's funny, we were talking about this in my office, and when I do a ton of town hall meetings, when I go out and engage voters in my region, mm -hmm. uh, if, if you tell me the issue, I can tell you, I, I can usually guess with a pretty good confidence uh, what is the age of the person who asked the question. Right. And when I get asked about debt, it's usually someone in their mid-60s or over. And I think that's driven by personal experience from either they themselves or their parents going through difficult financial circumstances. Um, and having, you know, having that experience of 
having to navigate difficult economic times in a very personal way is something that shapes a person. You know, uh, I don't know that that is an experience that, even though the you know the Great Recession is that not that far away, I am not sure that that is as shaping of uh, experience for millennials. Uh, and I also think that, um, you know, if you look at the personal financial circumstances of most Americans, it's, uh, it's a data point that when you blow it out, um, helps understand our nation's financial difficulties. By and large, most Americans aren't able to weather a significant problem, whether that be a healthcare emergency or uh, disruption of housing or the loss of a job. Mm -hmm. Most Americans don't have substantial personal savings. Uh, most Americans are not ready for retirement. Right. Um, and so, uh, you know, I don't know if that, uh, I, don't, I don't know if that's a mistake of baby boomers, I don't sort of cast judgment on that, but it's just a reality for, uh, for many American families. And I think as a consequence, you've seen uh, that probably shape the opinion of some young people. I mean, it, it, I think it's a curiosity that the Great Recession didn't have quite the same shock value as I think many of us would have thought it would have. I mean, certainly in, in the years preceding the Great, the great Recession, I think uh, a general theory uh, uh, among those of us who um, really th felt that there needed to be much more attention on these issues was that a, a big drop in the stock market, a sudden shock like that would get people's senses uh, together and that they would uh, really understand the issue and focus on it. And yet it didn't, that does not seem to have happened. Uh, it didn't persist for very long. Yeah. And I think maybe one of the reasons might be that, again, going back many years, if you think of the periods of the 70s and 80s, certainly 60s, 70s and 80s, this was a long period of constant turbulence in, in the economy, mm -hmm. in all countries, in my country, in the UK, and, and here, slow growth, high inflation, lots of business cycles in the sense of lots of stop and go in the economy. Mm -hmm. And it really became like bad weather, something you all, everybody was aware of uh, and, uh, and, and, and shaped people. Whereas this, this short shock does not seem to have had the same effect, I think, which is intriguing because I think it, it, it perhaps undercuts the idea that if there was just a big drop in the stock market sometime soon, people would, would see the need to take action. So, so I think it's an interesting how this, um, this, uh, this little impact of, of the Great Recession on, on younger people. Um, tell me a little bit more about the uh, fiscal state of the nation because as, you, know, you are trying to take the initiative to to make clearer to people, particularly to younger people, yeah. these dangers. Can you explain what it is and, and sort of the logic behind it? Yeah. Um, it's a bill that actually came out of one of the groups that uh, uh, you mentioned that I'm a part of called the Bipartisan Working Group, mm -hmm. um, which is meeting right now, actually. I, I walked out on the meeting to come here. Uh, I appreciate uh, that. No, no, it's my pleasure. <laughs> uh, the, uh, but the notion was in an effort to elevate the issue of debt, we have to start talking about it. Mm -hmm. And to bring in someone who's not a politician to address a joint session of Congress and just talk about here's, here's where we are as a nation um, in an objective way. I think the idea is to shine a light on the problem and at least get policymakers to um, start with the same fact base. Mm -hmm. Some of the groups that have engaged on the issue of debt have suggested that at the very least that should happen in the year before a presidential election, mm -hmm. at least to sort of tee up the issue among uh, the presidential candidates. I, I, I've watched most of all of the presidential debates so far. I'd, I'm trying to think. I don't recall the issue of debt even being asked about yet. I, I may have forgotten, but um, right. you know, to some degree, uh, uh, we, you and I, and I think everyone in this room could sit and acknowledge this is a problem, but it very much is not a problem that is breaking through 
driving public sentiment. And as a consequence, you don't have that virtuous cycle of public sentiment driving public policy making. Mm -hmm. I, I think that uh, there's a lot of interest in, in the idea of a, a fiscal state of the nation uh, here, some of our work here at Brookings and lots of other organizations. Yeah. And I think kind of one of the uh, um, reasons for that is, is the feeling that there's lots of information actually about the future. We see trustees reports on the Medicare and Social Security program every year, usually painting a pretty bleak, bleak picture. We see the, the long-term CBO um, reports uh, indicating that. There's lots of information sort of throughout the year. And uh, it certainly struck us that, that the idea of a fiscal state of the nation might be an effective tool by taking so much of this information that is dispersed yeah. and comes out in sort of dribs and drabs all through the year and have it in sort of one big bang with, with a lot of attention to it. Um, that's certainly the way we've been thinking about it. It sounds like you're thinking along the, very much the same way. Yeah, I, I think that's right. Now, I, I, as I mentioned, I think that is not going to be as compelling as Greta Thunberg uh, sure. presenting to the United Nations, right? That, probably not. That is no, undeniably yeah. true. Uh, but if, if we're going to at least start engaging on the issue of debt, and I think we should, this the problem isn't going to get better simply by ignoring it. Right. Um, one, it means we have to start with a common fact base. Uh, and two, we have to get the public more mobilized uh, on it. Um, and I would also argue that some of this, and I mentioned this, I think we have to personalize the issue to people. I mean, I'll, I will tell you, um, I am a stronger advocate now for the solvency of Social Security, having met with a financial planner and being asked whether it would be there. And I'm also a stronger advocate for it now because I got to see my own grandmother benefit from it. My grandmother, we lost her earlier this year. She was 13 days shy of 109 years old. Someone just asked me um, recently, was, it, was her passing expected? And I said, yes, every day for the last 20 years. <laughs> um, but her husband, my grandfather, died in 1981. So I got to see for 38 years her ability to live with dignity driven by what I consider one of the most successful public policies in the history of this country, Social Security. Right. And as a consequence, when it became personal, it becomes something that I, well, you know, hell no, I don't want to see that go away. I want to make sure that everybody can retire with dignity. And I don't think that that dynamic generally exists on a lot of these large fiscal matters. There is not a straight line connection between the ballooning of debt service payments and our ability to fund important financial aid programs that ensure that the doors of educational opportunity are open right. for everybody. Right. There is not a straight line connection yet between rising debt service payments and our inability to invest in clean water and clean air and investments that help us rise to the climate mm -hmm. challenge. There is not a straight line connection between ballooning debt service and our capacity to fund vital programs in the Department of Housing and Urban Development that drive urban renewal and ensure that people can afford to live in right. a community. So, and to some degree that's on all of us collectively to try to connect those dots a bit better than we have. Right. Let me open up uh, for questions from the audience. I know we've got just a few more minutes and uh, we've got somebody, let's see, just over there. And when, he, when I say a question, I mean something short that has a question mark at the end and is related to the topic. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, my name is Michael. It's one of the simplest solutions to the debt problem seems to be to make the people that have a lot of money pay more in taxes. And we're constantly going in the opposite direction, both Democrats and Republicans, over the last 20 or 30 years. And the other thing is about removing the cap on Social Security taxes for high income earners. I think that would go a big way to solving some of the. So there's relatively simple solutions, it's just the politics isn't there to accomplish it. So there's, uh, let me speak to both of those. Um, one, on debt, uh, every bipartisan commission, nonpartisan commission, think tank that has looked at this issue has pretty much concluded the same thing. And that is the problem's too big simply to tax your way out of it, simply to cut your way out of it, or simply to depend on economic growth as a strategy out of it. In the end, you're going to have to have a comprehensive solution that probably requires both parties to swallow a little bit of something that they don't want, um, which 
to some degree, I would argue, is an opportunity, particularly in a period of, of um, divided government, to, to perhaps you know, uh, uh, come up with a grand bargain. I think that is farther away now than it was 10 years ago. Um, on uh, Social Security, there's a, a bill that I think might actually see some traction, in, at least in the House, called the Social Security 2100 Act. Uh, that would largely do what you're suggesting, which is asking the most well-off to pay a bit more to address the ongoing solvency of Social Security and also to try to make sure that Social Security is more reflective of the costs that seniors actually face. That's a bill that now has over 200 sponsors in, in the House. Um, my sense is that bill could see some forward motion. Uh, and. And if it does, at the very least, I think you might see at least some more public engagement on the, uh, on the issue. Uh, this gentleman here. Thank you. Thank you. Sandy Apgar, CSIS. Could Congress, perhaps through your new committee, require every bill to be translated into individual or unit terms? For example, housing. I feel that it's not just about the cost per house, but the life cycle to maintain it. Mm -hmm. And in climate, uh, how much of the coastal areas will disappear in 50 years? The science is known, but the analysis is often weak. Um, is that an act that's relatively procedural? And you and I have both learned as McKinsey consultants to translate in analysis into terms that a client, in this case, the country could understand. I find very very opaque most Congress, most bills, yeah. and many Brookings analyses for that matter. Well, um, I don't want to agree with the last part of that because we're in we're at Brookings, so <laughs> I never complain about the food at a dinner party. Um, the uh, you, you, you mentioned the, so I'm chairing this select committee on the modernization of, of uh, Congress. Um, about every 20 or 30 years or so, Congress realizes things are not working that well, and they create a committee to do something about it. This year's committee is called the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress. I know it sounds super sexy. Um, but uh, one of the things that we're looking at is transparency um, with, regard to, um, with regard to bills to better engage the American people and have Congress uh, better able to engage on things that solve problems for the American people. I would argue if you've, if you've ever read a bill in Congress, it's mostly gibberish, right? Like it, you, you, you don't get to look at what's being changed in existing law. You only get to see largely, you know, sentence fragments. Um, it's complete gibberish. And so one of the things that we've already made a recommendation on, and we're hoping to see it, uh, it move soon, is to actually, as most state legislatures do, when you have a bill, uh, be able to look at what's, what, what, what is current law and what's being added or stricken from current law, not just to make that more um, uh, understandable to uh, public policymakers, but to the American public too. You, you mentioned a, a separate issue, which is actually looking at, as we take on legislation, um, trying to help define what it means to the average American. I think that's, um, uh, uh, that can happen by mandate, but I think largely when someone brings forward a bill, the, um, the important thing is to make that connection to the American people. That's actually how you help move legislation through the legislative process. You know, it was mentioned, I, I worked on a bill to try to help poor people save money. And it was based on uh, uh, Harvard research from an uh, economist up there that suggested that by and large, um, asset poor people don't have savings and they disproportionately gamble and play the lottery. And he this economist came up with the notion called prize-linked savings, where you could take the excitement of gambling and have it apply to saving money. And as I went out and talked about it, like that's something that people could generally say, like, oh, I kind of get that, right? And so our task on every piece of legislation that we introduce is to try to make those connections. 
Let me ask, which I think will be the last question, because I know you have to get back to the, to the caucus. This is from Twitter, and I think it pretty well summarizes a lot of questions that we have, and it goes like this. Given very low interest rates, is there a case that we can afford to wait to solve our fiscal imbalance, while the dynamics of climate change are quite different? I think it's undeniable that we need, uh, we're passing a point of no return on climate. Uh, and it's why you see a sense of urgency by millennials. It's why you're seeing a sense of urgency, certainly out of the house in terms of driving. You know, one of the, when you're in the majority, the first nine bills are set aside for your priorities. And it's, there's a reason that the Climate Action Now bill is one of the priority bills uh, among House Democrats is because it requires um, significant action. I think we're playing with fire a little bit when it comes to the debt in that right now interest rates are low, but when they go up, debt service as a component of the total budget rises sharply. Um, uh, will rise very significantly. Mm -hmm. And the concern is if we wait until then to take action, we're either going to be facing very significant cuts or very significant spikes uh, in, in, in taxes. Um, and as I mentioned to the gentleman's question, if we're going to get a handle on our fiscal challenges, we're going to have to pull a whole lot of levers. Those levers get a lot tougher to pull, and the solution set gets a whole lot less attractive, mm -hmm. the one, the longer we wait. And all of those things are more, all of those pills are more bitter, bitter to swallow if you're doing it in the midst of a recession, right. right? If we wait until difficult economic times, that is not, that is not an ideal time to raise revenue, and it's not an ideal time to substantially cut government spending. And as a consequence, what you've seen is, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, unfortunately, even during a period of economic growth, you've seen uh, Congress largely acting, acting pro-cyclically, right? Where you've seen, uh, to the gentleman's question, uh, tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans in a period of economic growth and substantially increased spending in a period of, uh, of substantial economic, of, uh, of economic growth. Right. I would argue if we were going to be um, more strategic about this, we would probably be um, acting counter-cyclically, you know, pushing money into the economy when we're in a period of, mm -hmm. of downturn, but making some tougher choices during a period of economic growth. Good. Thank you so much for joining us Thank today. you. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.